Good afternoon. We're going to get underway with the second session of the conference. This is a panel on political parties and elections. I'm Thomas Carruthers. I'm a <coughs> vice president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. It's my pleasure to serve as the moderator of this session. And let me just briefly introduce, I'm saying hello to John Shattuck. <laughs> Let me briefly introduce the people on the panel. Uh, we have Benjamin Riley, who's head of the policy school at the Murdoch University Graduate School, old friend and a longtime scholar of elections and related <coughs> matters. Patricia Calca, uh, from the Technical University of Kaiser Latern, Portugal, will be second. And then Philippe Schmitter, of course, with a group like this, needs no introduction. Uh, <coughs> very distinguished political scientist who's been associated in recent years with the European University Institute in Florence. And by video, uh, we have uh, Marina uh, Weisband, who's associated with the Pirate Party in Germany. She's unable to come today, but she filmed a video presentation, which we'll have after the three speakers. Let me just say a couple of words by way of introduction to the topic, elections and political parties. Turning first to elections, <coughs> We see several big things have occurred with respect to elections in the last 25, 30 years of this era of political change. The first is, in very simple terms, there's been a tremendous explosion in the number of credible elections, not always free and fair, but at least somewhat credible elections around the world, in every region of the world. Uh, probably there have been more credible elections in the last 30 years than all of human history before that, if one wanted to count. Um, so it's been an era of just tremendous electioneering. Secondly, as elections have proliferated as a, as a political process, uh, with that has also come a great deal of heterogeneity and complexity in the role that elections play in different kinds of political contexts. And so although we tend to think of elections in a, in a certain way as a, with a sort of a sort of simple or single set of ideas about what political instrumentalities they perform. In fact, elections have become a very varied area. So there's a whole body of analysis, for example, of the functions of elections in semi-authoritarian regimes, the roles they play, the legitimizing force, and so forth. And one can <coughs> differentiate the role of elections in many different contexts now. And then third, with the proliferation and the greater heterogeneity has come search for alternatives not just alternatives to elections, but first to a search for different kinds of electoral processes, different ways to organize elections, electoral reform in many different countries and trying to understand what kind of electoral system best fits what's kind of, what kind of polity. So there's been a tremendous search for uh, a deeper understanding of, of how to make elections work effectively. And then with that as well, in some cases, a search for alternatives to elections altogether, or alternative forms of elections and moving away from elections. Now, with political parties, we see uh, a somewhat similar trilogy of, of uh, features and factors. First, there's been a tremendous proliferation of political parties in the world in the last 30 years. Again, probably more political parties have existed in the last 30 years than in all of human history put together before that. There's been a just, as we know, and we could name any number of countries where there's 20, 50, 100, 150 political parties which have uh, operated in this new period of political life. So first, we've just seen a, a fluorescence of political parties. And secondly, similarly as with elections, with that has come a tremendous heterogeneity of the kinds of forms and functions that political parties play. So that if one goes to a country and says, oh, here's a political party, one can't always assume that the role, the form and the functions of that political party are necessarily what one is thinking of when one thinks of political party. So there's a great deal of efforts to understand uh, political parties in new ways. And then third, similarly to elections as well, uh, there's a search for political party reform. This has been an era of a tremendous uh, attempted effort on the part both domestically and through international support of, of efforts to reform political parties uh, in many different ways to make them more inclusive, more transparent, more law-abiding, law as well as more representative in different ways, and so forth. And 
as with elections also, a search for alternatives to political parties. Is it possible to have a democracy that functions uh, without political parties is the question that many people have been asking in the last 10 years at least, given the travails of political parties in most places. So both elections and parties present very deep questions that, that are sort of definitional to understanding our contemporary political era. So there's a lot to take on, um, but fortunately we have some good people to at least give us a few insights about parts of these issues, and then we'll try to generate a broader question around these issues with all, all of you involved as well. So, Ben, over to you. Thanks, Tom. <clears throat> and um, thanks very much for the invitation to uh, come here. I haven't had the opportunity to get to see you before, so it's, um, it's really good to be here. Um, I took the uh, subject of making democracy work a little bit more literally than um, some of the other panelists. Uh, and so I'm going to give you a bit of a potted, empirical, um, good news story um, about a couple of um, institutional innovations in relation to elections and political parties used around the world that, that might be of relevance in terms of this much broader project about making democracy work. Um, and I'll give you the good news, and if people are interested in the bad news side of what I'm talking about, I'm happy to, to take that up in questions too. But I've, I've tried to uh, keep my focus on the positive um, for, this, uh, for this 10 minutes. Um, one of the areas that I've worked on um, for quite some time now is uh, electoral incentives in ethnically divided societies or in uh, polarised societies that can reduce incentives for uh, division, violence, polarisation, and instead encourage accommodation, strategic cooperation, a focus on the political centre. That's been a sort of focus of my work, um, actually, since I did my PhD. And I think, I think, yeah, and you said this yourself, you know, the, 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 the problem of polarisation um, a lot of this literature was initially focused on uh, ethnically divided states, often in uh, new democracies, often in third world countries. Um, but as we've seen in the United States in recent years, the problem of polarisation has actually become very central to uh, uh, the problems that Western political systems are experiencing. Uh, the US, uh, probably the best example of all. Um, one of the interesting things that's happening in the US at the moment, despite the incredible difficulty in getting any institutional reform up in what is, has become a very sclerotic um, political system, is that there's more experimentation with different kinds of voting systems at the local level that may scale up um, in the fullness of time to national level institutions. Um, when I was uh, living in Washington and getting to know Tom, um, a book came out by uh, Tom Mann and um, Noel Morenstein called It's Even Worse Than It Looks um, about the US Congress. Uh, and um, uh, they had three recommendations for their changes to US political and electoral institutions. And one was the introduction of what the Americans call ranked choice voting what in Australia we call preferential voting, what in the London mayoral elections I think is called sequential voting, which is called the alternative vote in the electoral systems literature. So it doesn't really have one name. This is, it's a very simple idea that inst instead of asking a voter to say which candidate or party is their choice, you also ask them to say who they would choose if that candidate or party didn't win. So who would be their second choice if you couldn't get your first choice? And quite often, who would be your third choice if neither of those got it? So the, you know, a very simple, small-scale reform, or so it appears. But the evidence increasingly suggests that just asking voters to express that gradation of preferences changes the incentives in, the, in an electoral campaign from what is often a very zero-sum uh, you know, you either win or you lose, and uh, a process that in places like the United States has clear, clearly encouraged polarisation as, as both parties have tended to move uh, uh, more from the political centre towards the extremes because um, that's where the voter base is. Uh, these sorts of systems increasingly, it appears, push in the other direction, push towards the political centre. 
And there's a, if you think about the mechanics of uh, second choice votes coming in when no first choice winner uh, gets up, you can see that um, it, it makes sense. It makes sense. In Australia, we are actually having an election campaign at the moment, not that you would know, because it's incredibly boring. It's incredibly boring. And one reason that it's incredibly boring is it's incredibly centrist. So the two major parties are arguing over trying to sit in the exact middle ground where the median voter sits. And they do this because if you want to win office under a vote transfer, rank choice voting system, which, which we have in Australia, then to get those second preference votes from people who didn't put you as number one but still think you're an okay number two or number three choice, you can't alienate them. Right? You can't say they're idiots, they're scumbags, they're, they're, they're traitors. You need to have a form of election rhetoric as a strategic device, not because people are nicer, that uh, allows you to pick up second and third choice votes. And so um, we have an exceptionally dull election campaign, but which is exceptionally focused on the political centre. And there's been some very interesting research that's come out of the United States, just published in electoral studies, looking at the US local municipalities and cities that have introduced this kind of electoral system, places like Minneapolis, Oakland, San Francisco, a couple of others, and found the exact same patterns, that the, the, the different electoral incentives have created greater electoral civility than was previously the case. You also means you tend to get more median uh, electoral candidates elected. Um, you, you would not get a Mr Trump elected under this system. There's been some research that suggests that even in the Republican primaries, Trump wouldn't have won if you had this system, although that's, that's, that's much less clear. So um, uh, if we look at the recent London mayoral elections uh, that uh, Sadiq Khan won, similar system, slightly different to the way we use it in Australia, but similar basic idea. Uh, Khan didn't win an overall majority, but although he probably would have won a, under a plurality system anyway, he picked up sufficient votes, number two votes from mostly from the Green candidate. So sent, he was sort of centre left, candidate to the left of him. Those flowed through to help him to a comfortable electoral victory. So I think it's, it, this is one area where there is, um, I think, Small technical changes can, can change the dynamics of the electoral games in, in somewhat unexpected ways and create um, more emphasis on the political centre, but also a more um, uh, civil style of, of campaigning. Um, and so not surprisingly, this particular electoral reform is, seems to be spreading uh, <laughs> uh, around the world in, in a number of places. Um, a second trend not so popular, but um, quite prevalent in Asia, where I've done a lot of my own work, are attempts to do something similar with political parties. Um, political parties, as Tom mentioned, uh, are you know, obviously central to, to the democratic uh, a, a, a electoral process, but if you're trying to get away from polarisation with political parties, you run into real obstacles in terms of political freedoms, because why shouldn't a political party represent all segments of society? Why shouldn't um, the extremes have their political party too? Um, Indonesia, when it became a democracy um, back in the late 1990s, or returned to democracy, because they had had a brief experience in the 1950s with it, faced this exact issue when they were thinking about their own political system um, and the, the nature of their political parties. Because Indonesia, um, extremely big, diverse country, looked at that point as if it was going to break up because there were so many secessionist parties each advocating for independence in different parts of the country. So one of the things the Indonesians did was say, uh, we're going to, you can set up, you can be the free Papua party if you want, we, we're not, but you can only be on the ballot for national elections if you have a national organisational base across the entire country. And that, that's a couple of thousand miles, 17,000 islands, that's a very big task. What that did was, again, change the nature of the game 
to make all the, the only parties that were able to compete in national elections nationally based parties, because they were nationally based, they had to appeal across the archipelago for votes. In doing so, they had to appeal, most of them, to, to a range of ethnic and religious groups. And of course, it made the idea of being a, a, a secessionist party completely unviable. Now, it had a lot of drawbacks as well. Um, it probably wouldn't even be legal in Europe, as I understand the Copenhagen um, criteria. I, I think you know, banning a particular region from having its own party, I don't think, would pass muster. Um, but Indonesia today, against all predictions, is one of the most successful new democracies um, still in the developing world. It's also, of course, the largest Muslim country and um, probably the most successful uh, Muslim democracy. And one of the things that's allowed it to become that is just this little, again, you know, a reform that didn't get a great deal of attention. The Indonesians combined that with similar rules for electing their president. The president had to get votes from across the archipelago. You couldn't just get elected, just getting votes from, you know, Java, where half the population lives, for example. So these sorts of what I call centripetal incentives have actually proved hugely consequential in keeping that very large, very diverse country, uh, not only together, but keeping the focus of political competition uh, relatively moderate. And um, Indonesia's interesting in that th th there's always been Islamist parties, but they've never really been able to grow and command the sort of support that they have in the Middle East. And I think this kind of electoral engineering, it's not the only reason by any means, but it's one part of the explanation for why uh, I Islamism has not become a big political force in Indonesia, despite it having many of the conditions, you would think, um, for Islamism to thrive. Um, the place where these sorts of rules potentially, I think, have most application in the future, like I said, probably not in Europe, um, but if we were ever to see a democratic China, for example, the Chinese rulers have exactly the same preoccupations that the Indonesians had uh, at the fall of Suharto. You know, they, their number one issue is always going to be stability, national integrity, and so on. So these sorts of rules are being looked at, um, uh, particularly in Asia, as I've said. Um, third one, and this is an area where I think um, students, there's a good PhD in this next subject, internal electoral rules, internal uh, rules to choose executives within parliaments, internal rules to determine power sharing governments, um, rules to elect um, presidential elect, uh, 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 executives in some cases. This is an area where there's been a great deal of innovation in recent years, but it's hardly been picked up by, by scholars and political scientists. A, a few have looked at it. Um, for example, the Northern Ireland peace process, which of course has been studied to death, probably you know, one of the world's most overstudied conflicts, one of my Irish friends once said to me. Um, the particular electoral rule used to allocate ministerial positions under the Northern Ireland peace process was a, a unique um, uh, uh, modification of a particular kind of electoral system called DONT, proportional representation. I won't go into the details of it. The key is that it allocates ministries sequentially to each party based on their strength at the election. Now, you might say, so what? Well, I've been involved in a number of cases of power sharing where it was precisely this issue that actually destroyed attempts to put together a power sharing executive. Um, I'm from Australia. We have a, a little Pacific island um, not far from us, five hours flying, not close, Fiji, which has attempted to do this repeatedly over the last decade and actually borrowed the South African power sharing system. Uh, constitutional lawyers went in, every, they, they, everyone, <coughs> they, they picked what they thought was a fantastic form of power sharing, but the one thing that they didn't have was a way of allocating ministries fairly. And so what happened was <coughs> when uh, the new government was instituted, they, they took all the good ministries for themselves and for their power sharing partners on the other side of the ethnic divide that happened to be the Indian party, they literally gave, I think, offered a ministry for dog catching or something like this. It was sort of a, a calculated insult. And the whole thing fell apart, right? Even though it was there in the constitution, never got implemented just because of this single one issue. So again, um, 
There's some really interesting advances in Northern Ireland. The, the Switzerland, there's a fascinating um, uh, uh, recent modification of the, the magic formula in Switzerland that is worth looking at as well if you're interested in this. Also a lot of very unsuccessful experiments in places like Bosnia and Burundi and elsewhere. Um, as I said, this is an area that's ripe for further study. Um, and in some ways, even though it, again, is a sort of small and technical, I think has potentially big implications. So to sum up, um, a couple of, just a couple of ideas and a couple of sort of empirical cases um, based on the benefits of empowering the political centre, having um, clear incentives in terms of the, uh, the, the, the electoral and um, party institutions, um, uh, uh, trying to combat the appeal of polarisation and really focusing on aggregating rather than dividing common interests. Um, so I think, um, well, let me leave it there, Tom, and you can take questions. Thanks very much, Ben. Um, I think we'll find throughout the discussion that the relationship between the kinds of instrumental modifications of electoral systems and party systems that aim to try to shape uh, outcomes is something that stands alongside of and sort of in contrast to what we often think of as underlying structural socioeconomic drivers of polarization or movement away from the center. And I know those are issues that Philippe is interested in. So let's keep in mind the dualism between with both elections and parties, how much in a sense one can create systems that, that structure you know, tendencies or outcomes versus the underlying forces that are driving these same institutions in different directions. Um, let's turn next to Patricia Coffey. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Is this working? I need my PowerPoint, yeah. please. Yeah, very good. Ah, cool. Um, okay, it works. So, hello to everybody. I would like to start by thanking the organization for inviting me. Um, although I have to confess, have I known that Portugal would play Hungary yesterday when I arrived? Um, um, I don't know if I would accept. <laughs> um, well, that passed. So, um, before I started, I would like to tell all of you that um, uh, this uh, is a, a together project, a paper that I wrote with uh, a colleague, Martin Gross from Mannheim University. Um, and more than give you suggestions that we don't really have, I would like you to, to be aware of our conclusions and maybe yourselves try to interpret uh, from our conclusions what we can read um, into reality. So to say, so um, for this presentation, I call it political parties and elections, reactions to the euro crisis. Um, and basically we were interested in uh, how the, the euro crisis influenced what um, are called as a more, um, can I say, resistant institution, if you want to call it, that are parties. So we know that parties take a long time to change and we were not sure if they actually changed, but we were kind of um, having a huge fight in the office about, oh no, parties are reacting to the crisis, oh no, parties are not reacting to the crisis. Actually, our question was something like how parties react to anticipated events like external shocks. Uh, but before I go to these more specific details, I would like to, to give you a kind of a general framework. So about what do we know? We know that the economic and financial crisis, I put 2008, you know that this is affected, uh, first started by affecting the US and then Europe, the rest of the world and so on. Uh, and we know that this had a huge economic, social, political impact and though uh, this is what we consider an external shock. Uh, and then I would explain to you why we are using this term as external shock um, for the crisis. Um, and then we wanted to see if there was government's reactions. And I, when I say reactions, I say measures. I guess everybody would say, yes, of course, there was reactions. Uh, but this was still to, to be proved, so to say. So we read in the news every single day that the countries are reacting, that Greece is doing this, that Portugal is doing that, that Germany is doing that. 
but what what does this mean effectively um, and so we were asking what about the parties uh, there was gradual or fast changes like all the literature says that the parties take time to 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 change or to react if you prefer to put it like that and so we also think that policy responsiveness <laughs> has something to do with that we question there so and in, in this paper, we try to connect two kind of branches of literature that have to do with party behavior and also with political economy kind of perspective on uh, external shocks. So how institutions react to external shocks or don't react. Actually, our paper's name is something like to adapt or to disregard, something like that. So just to have an idea, maybe this is a little bit small, Just to have a quick idea, our story, so our, our theory about what happened was that there was an external shock, and then in countries where there was a low impact voter, uh, there was a low impact in the country, voters reacted to that, parties reacted to voters' kind of perceptions, and there was a given policy position. And then, where is more meat, so to say, in parties where there was a higher impact, uh, voters also felt that more, and so kind of parties in opposition and parties in government kind of read what voters, what, which preference of voters had, and so parties of opposition uh, don't propose so much of a change in policies, and uh, parties in government had a higher change. So this is was very simplified way our story about what potentially had happened. So and we. We, for that, we created two hypotheses that we wanted to, to look at. And again, this is very stylized because we needed to, to get to the empirics, right? And we know that this is way more complex than just these two specific points. But um, so our first hypothesis was, and systematizing this, like in countries where an external shock has been more severe, parties shift uh, their policy positions more than parties in the other countries. And then, so kind of differentiating uh, countries where the, the impact was higher from the countries where the impact was lower. And then, uh, in, in countries where there were, that were more exposed to these, um, uh, to these shocks, the, the parties in government had to change more, so had a, a higher change in their policy positions because they had to react than parties in opposition. So this was what we think it was happening. So, and how uh, did we test that? So, we, we used um, expert judgments on the Chapel Hill survey, expert survey, um, because they gave us a dimension that is the economic dimension and not just the left, right, like the rile um, positioning that was important for us because we kind of had the, the idea that the left, right positioning was probably not the thing that was changing more, but more the economic policies of the of the, the parties. Uh, we use also gather data from OECD, the World Bank, so more uh, economic data, and basically we look at the first from uh, 2006 and 2010, before and after the the, the shock. Um, so, in terms of the dependent variable, so what we wanted to explain was uh, a party positions uh, change, and then we we used the, uh, as independent variables uh, a GDP growth rate as as the impact of the crisis in the in the in the in the growth rate of the the, the country, um, and also uh, if uh, a party was a government party or not, and then we control for the the the, the normal normal variables that I don't want to, to, to describe here too much. Um, or this literature, niche parties, large parties, all these, these, these uh, radical parties uh, kind of um, variables that usually <coughs> the literature considers. Um, so, here. Um, just before I continue to that, I would like to tell you why do we consider this an external shock, because this has been uh, the crisis, I mean, uh, because this was also conceptually um, um, not that clear to define. And so um, 
usually external shops are an, an, an anticipated uh, for the political actors. So we consider that the financial crisis that affect first um, uh, the US and then uh, Europe was unanticipated. So we have to buy this assumption if we want to consider this as, a, as an external shock. Again, this, this is an assumption that we have to buy to believe that is an external shock. Uh, also, that is external to the European parties, meaning that when the US uh, government decided not to, um, not to save the Lehman Brothers, um, we have to consider that this has nothing to do with uh, the fact that there was uh, parties in Europe. So I guess this is quite, yeah, quite easy to believe. Uh, and then the, the third, third kind of characteristic is that, that this had a huge impact. And I guess this is, everybody knows that this is true, right? We all feel that in Europe, still continue to feel it. Um, so I'd like to, to you to give a look at these, these graphs. So basically these are all the countries. So we used 168 parties from 24 European democracies. And here you, you can see the, the, the parties. Uh, the parties, the, the, the countries. And if you see the left-right uh, policy shift, so 2006 is the, the circle, and 2010 is, is this one. There is not too big changes with some, some exceptions that we sh could look. But the, the difference, though, so there is not a big uh, shift. But if you look at the economic uh, aspects, there is bigger shifts in, in most of them. So this is just like descriptive, but you can see. So the, the data of the Chapel Hill data is based in expert surveys, right? So uh, you have to, to, to believe also in this kind of data, but I guess it's, it's a quite renowned. Um, so about the DNLs, about our conclusions. Um, uh, higher impact, higher reaction, so in parties, so we confirmed that in, in, in countries that there was a higher impact, economic impact in the country, immediate impact. There was a, a higher reaction of the parties. In general, the, 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 the system kind of moved in average. And also, if, we, if uh, uh, a given party is in office, is going to change more the policy position than if it's not. So this is like the... The, our empirical conclusions, so corroborating our our um, hypothesis. So just to wrapping up, and um, how does how can we relate these with our general thematic here? Um, so this shock or this kind of uh, shock, external shocks, and when I talk about external shocks, you can think about something like a earthquake or something. So I'm not just talking about something uh, that is financial. In this paper, we looked at uh, this economic shock, this financial and economic shock, but this can be considered, considered other situations, something that is external to the system and that the system has to deal with. Uh, actually, this is part of uh, another project that we are developing now about some kind of environmental crisis and so on. How does this impact in political systems, especially in this case of the party? So um, a shock changes uh, party competition. So party has to reconsider their policy positions. Um, and the previous is highly related with public opinion because, you know, like people start dealing with the consequences of the, in this case of a financial uh, crisis and an economic crisis, and they change also their preferences regarding policies, and so politicians have to react to that. You can also say that a big deal of here is, cons is the, 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 um, the mass media kind of role. But, uh, and uh, the other aspect is that there is a higher voter attention, a higher level of voter attention to economic issues, and again, the mass media are kind of in, in between what can be good but can also be bad. And when I say that can be bad um, is because if voters pay attention exclusively or more dramatically to economic issues, there is collateral aspects like social systems and so on in the countries that are more affected. That, of course, people are feeling that, but if people are essentially uh, demonstrating against 
uh, pure economic uh, issues, there's other aspects that should be considered. And so if public, op uh, public opinion just directs to economic issues, maybe there is other aspects in the society that are kind of neglected. neglected. And I think in the debate at the European level, this was very visible. We were invaded and continue to be with economic aspects of the crisis, right, uh, uh, rates and et cetera on. But lots of times the, the mass media also don't talk about the social impacts that this has in, in the several countries. So I would like to, to finish by leaving this, this point. And thank you very much. Thank you, Patricia. Well, let's pass on directly now to, to uh, Philippe Schmitter. Philippe? Yeah. Yes, well, I wanted to thank John and Zonia for what you have done to bring me here. It's a pleasure to be back at the, not only at the Central European University, but in Budapest, a city that I have come to like <laughs> very much. Uh, this, my presentation is a side product of a very interesting and very unusual project, which was sponsored by the Council of Europe. I'm sorry that Andras Bozok is not here because he was part of that project. Uh, they asked us to put together a working group mixed of academics and politicians, real life politicians, uh, from the local to the national level, all active in one way or another in the Council of Europe uh, Assembly, to discuss the, for the future of democracy. So basically, we academics produced position papers, let's call it, and tried them out on politicians and then modified. And then at the end, we came up with 29 proposals for reform. Of those 29, 12 have something to do with parties and elections. Now, I have 12 and I have 10 minutes, so that's not going to be easy. I can give you a bit of a flavor for them. I'm going to talk about three of them in a little bit more detail, but I'll give you a, a flavor for some of them. First, there's this question of discretionary voting, which has a little bit, but it's a different version than the one Benjamin. And this has to do with nota voting, none of the above. So one suggestion is that every election should have a third, fourth, or fifth candidate called none of the above. And you check that one. And so you encourage, as it is now, people who believe none of the above just don't vote. So this gives them a, a, a chance, I think. So uh, that's one idea. Then we had the idea of lotteries. So every election would have a lottery. So you not only vote, but you get a lottery ticket. And then the winners of the lottery are announced almost simul or simultaneously with the winners of the election. Then we had a big discussion, actually Andras was involved in this part of it, over what do they win? And the answer was, finally, they would win a certain sum of money which they could distribute, not to themselves, but to causes or whatever, and they would do this some two or three months later after you know, receiving suggestions or whatever it is from civil society organizations and, and the like. Shared mandates is another thing. This was brought to our attention especially by uh, our Swedish um, local a mayor in the, up above the Arctic Circle, I might add. And uh, she pointed out that in the case of Sweden, there is a Sweden has more or less reached its limit in terms of the number of women and women candidates. It's still the best, I think, in the world. But it's, and the reason for this simply is the, the, the nature of the job of being a politician. So she suggested the idea of shared mandates. So you vote for two people. One is the kind of first person, right? For, and then you vote for somebody else, and you divide the work on the job so that you could still have a reasonable social life and, and family life or, or whatever it is. And she thought that this would be an important thing to encourage more women. Then there's voting rights for foreigners. Citizens Assembly, I'll come back to that later. Variable thresholds for election. Uh, that is to say, you would only get elected if you got a higher percentage of votes than you got the last time. So you'd move 
move the threshold, and if you didn't, then you'd have another election, right? But you had to get more, a higher percentage than you got the last time, okay? Intra-party democracy, that's uh, the question. Was, was the point. Then one I will talk about, vouchers for financing, electronic, so-called smart voting, which is now, I think, uh, catching on, or, no, you know, that, do you understand the smart voting? When you, candidates fill out their positions on a particular issue, and then voters fill out their positions, and the computer matches you and tells you what political party you should vote for. I have to confess that I took this somewhat <laughs> fancifully and maybe not seriously, and I ended up being a member of the Finnish par Pirate Party. So, so <laughs> this, was for, this was for the European election, so that... <clears throat> Well, then there's this whole idea of electronic, that you not only match with, the, with the, the, the candidate and the voter, but then you have a feedback. So whenever the candidate votes against something that he or she said they would, against the position he or she, you would get a message from your deputy or from this machine, which would tell you that your deputy had not voted as he or she promised to vote. Then there's obviously postal voting, electronic voting, that's going on all the time. Let me just talk then about three. First is universal citizenship. Namely, that, you know, as the situation is now, when you get to be 16 or 18, you become eligible to be a citizen, at least a citizen understood as eligible to vote. This idea is that you become a citizen the moment you're born. That is to say, if you're born in a situation in which it, you will become a citizen, either because your parents already are or because you're physically born in a particular country, location. And, however, the voting rights would go to one of the two parents until the child reaches a certain age. 16, some places, usually 18, right? So you would have votes for, so it's un voto un bebe was the way it was presented uh, in a television program I was on in Italy. So one by baby, one voter. Now, this has two important implications, I think. One is, one of the things we've discovered through survey research is that there has been a dramatic decline in what you could call the intergenerational transmission of party identity. So if you looked at the data, so Italy was an extreme case, but still, it's the one I know best. If you looked in, in, in the 1960s and 70s, something like 80% of the young population knew the party that their parents voted for there. And so there was this, that didn't mean necessarily that the child voted the same way, but at least they knew <laughs> what it was, and presumably this reflected some kind of a communication across generations. That has fallen now to less than 30% of Italian young people know who their parents voted for. And probably also because their parents aren't voting for the same people <laughs> from one election to another, and some of the parties, in, or many of the parties in Italy are quite new, so you could, but anyway, so this would encourage <laughs> A communication, that is to say, if you, once you got aware that your mama or papa was voting uh, for you, so to speak, you would want to know what they did with this vote, and presumably that sets up a communication across generations, and that's it. The other thing, of course, is to balance <coughs> the imbalance in uh, age, uh, the distribution, age distribution of voting. We all know that the older you are, the more likely you are to vote. So young people vote much, much less. And so people over 60s vote much, much more frequently. So politicians know this too, so they skew their appeal and their actual policies toward old people at the expense of young people. So this would now shift the balance back to younger people because most people have babies, they have it when they're young, right? I mean, so this is the, that's one idea anyway of, um, I presented this at some kind of a conference and a guy jumps up and he said, you know what you've done? You, you're recreating the Austro-Hungarian Empire. <laughs> <laughs> because it turned out that in Austro-Hungary, it was only the pater familius, but they had as many votes as you had in your household. I didn't know this, but of course it was a very small 
portion of the population that could vote, but you had multiple votes depending on how many children you had. Okay, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. <clears throat> Oh, a citizen's assembly. Here the idea is to address what I think is a problem which hasn't been mentioned, but I think we all know it is, it, that it's a, a fundamental transformation of the nature of liberal democracy is the professionalization of the role of politician. So in classic liberal democratic theory, people were elected where the deputies were supposed to be not only similar to their own electorate, but they were expected to be, uh, to live for politics and not from politics. So increasingly now politicians are professionals, they enter into the role of a politician and they expect to stay there <laughs> and it becomes a life project, okay? So the, 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 the and now, so what we needed, we thought we needed was a counterweight to professional politicians. And so we invented this idea of a citizen's assembly, which would be randomly chosen in the districts of the lower house, and then would meet for about a month or so every year to discuss one single bill. The opposition would indicate which bill. I mean, you'd have a certain proportion of deputies which would say, okay, this is a tax bill, whatever it is, one of the more contested members. And this citizen assembly would meet to discuss this and would hear the arguments, etc., and then vote up or down. And if they voted down, the bill would go back to the legislative process and have to be modified, presumably in, in accordance with this uh, vote, although it wouldn't be mandatory. So a citizen, but the important thing here is to reinsert into the practice of democracy the notion of random choice. <laughs> to get away from this professionalization, then you want a counterweight to it. This is a modest one. Uh, obviously, a body like that can't make decisions over a wide range of issues. It has to be focused on a particular topic, and they can't draft the legislation because that's just simply beyond any uh, capacity of, of, of um, uh, randomly selected people. But to reinsert then randomness as a principle of representation is important. Then finally, we to uh, we introduce something which is at the core of something Donatella mentioned uh, or stressed, <clears throat> namely corruption. One of the biggest sources of corruption is the financing of political parties. Right? I think we all know this, even under circumstances where there's a substantial amount of public funding. The problem with public funding is not only simply that it isn't adequate so parties always look for subsidiary or additional uh, funds, uh, which are often gleaned, um, let's say, by irregular means or non-transparent ones anyway. But the real problem is that the, the, the public financing of voting is based on the previous voting results. So it's a manifest uh, instrument of oligarchy. <laughs> so you're reproducing the previous vote and of course uh, making presumably a much more difficult the idea or the possibility of new parties. So vouchers for financing. So when you went, when you voted, you would vote and at the same time you would so to speak vote for a certain amount of money, say a hundred euros, for a party. It does not have to be the party you just voted for. And what's more, you would have none of the above. So you could say, I don't like any of the parties. This money goes to a pot, and from that pot, you can finance the creation of new parties with a certain number of signatures or, or whatever it is. So vouchers for funding political parties is, it seemed to me, a form of responsiveness or making a relationship between citizens of course, it would come out of public funds, but it wouldn't be necessarily out of the funds of any particular citizen, but from a general, general public revenue, and that would then be distributed by citizens rather than by this usual formula of the, pre, the results of the previous election. Well, that's it. Um, 
as far as I can tell, nobody's serious taking this seriously. There are a few other propositions which are happening, but we would deliberately set out to uh, think of far out, unlikely, uh, just to sort of stimulate discussions. But as I say, then we discovered something. Many times, I mean, one thing we didn't know is that there's a lot of experimentation going on at the local level. It's just not, I was very surprised, especially in Scandinavia, I might add. There's a lot of, of, of interesting experiments. And um, therefore, uh, the question then becomes what I call here the, the, the problem of scaling up. How do you move up from something that might work very well in a Finnish <laughs> town above the Arctic Circle or something like that? How do you scale this up to? the national government, and that's clearly a, a, a separate engineering problem, as you were talking about. But still, it seems to me that the, 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 the source of a lot of the innovation is not perceived because it is isolated or in, yeah, protected, so to speak, uh, at a, a very local level. So yes, there's a lot of experimentation with new rules and procedures. and. Um, we hope that somehow some of these ideas will flourish or something. So, thank you. Thank you, Philippe. I think uh, I'm sure some people would like to respond to some of uh, the things you presented. Both some of the ideas themselves might be interesting to discuss further, but also in a sense what they're getting at. You know, in a sense, what's what's underneath uh, the desire for these kind of reforms, and what do they point to? But first, we have a video um, from uh, Marina Weisband with the Pirate Party in Germany. So we're gonna that's gonna come on. It's about eight and a half minutes, I think, so about that length. And. Uh, My name is Marina Weisbond. I'm an educational psychologist, former political director of the Pirate Party of Germany and currently the project manager of the Aula project at Politik Digital e.V. The Pirate Party of Germany adapted Liquid Democracy via the software Liquid Feedback in 2009. It had not only the capacity to vote but also to create own proposals discuss them online and, after a filtering process, vote on them. As for the deliberation process, results were great. As a relatively young party with unexperienced members, through the online collaborative working process, we could create legislative proposals that were serious and professional. So, the supporters wanted to use the system as a binding way to vote on our party platform. But this is where opinions started to part. Because to vote online, you have to use real names to make the votes traceable and protect yourself from manipulation. But on the other hand, having your name connected to your political opinion online was considered a risk by many. Thus began the liquid wars. In the end, the Pirate Party of Germany has decided to not implement liquid democracy as a binding tool to vote online, which I find to be a huge mistake. Smaller pirate parties, however, like the one in Iceland and the one in Austria, have online participatory systems and have positive experience with them. Other implementations followed. Some communities in Germany and in the Ukraine use liquid democracy for their local politics. However, only at suggestions from the population. Now I found the idea of a binding liquid democracy system too intriguing and its implications for future politics too fascinating to just let it go. This is the things I had learned so far. The system works really well with participants with relatively few experience. It is a great tool for political education. Participation grows 
If the object of the discussion is tangible and concerns everyday life, participation also grows when the vote is binding for the executive institution. Votes are mostly delegated to people the participants know personally. And the system is traceable when it's used in a relatively confined space where participants know each other. Now, a relatively confined space with questions of everyday importance where education takes place is school. And this is a perfect place to start because we know that young people from the age of about 12 make reflected decisions. So this is the point where we should start teaching them things they will need later in life, like creating own ideas and writing them, uh, advocating them, discuss with each other, find compromise, and find supporters for your opinion and vote on them. And not as a mob following the most populist thought, but as a network with emergent intelligence. And thus, the Aula project was born. It is financed by the Federal Agency for Civic Education and implemented with the help of Politik Digitali e.V. The goal of the project is to develop and test a software and a manual for lessons for continuing implementation of a participatory system throughout school life. And this is how it works. First, a contract is signed between the school board, the teachers, the students and the parents. The school board signs a voluntary commitment to implement all the ideas that the students have voted upon. In the contract, they outline the frame within which students can decide on things and what they cannot decide. Students receive an account for an online platform. They can access it via their phones or the computers any time of day and night. There they choose a room. Some issues concern the whole school, some issues just the class or the afternoon club. In the room they can create their own ideas to improve any time. The ideas don't have to be very elaborate, two sentences are enough. In the next step students browse through the new ideas and find the ones they find interesting enough to talk about and um, they have a button put it on the table. If a sufficient number of students puts a proposition on the table, it is on the table, where it's open for discussion. Discussion takes place both online and offline. Online through change suggestions that can be voted up or down. And offline in weekly lessons where students get space to introduce their ideas discuss them, get help from teachers and suggestions from teachers, find similar ideas and opposing ideas, and to advocate their ideas, make posters and so on. This is where the learning really takes place. This process takes two weeks. After that, a proposal should be complete with all details and a proposition for financing. Now, Next, the school board or the principal takes a look at it and has to decide whether it's feasible. If it's not and contradicts the contract, they have to dismiss the idea, providing an explanation. If it is feasible, the idea continues into voting. In the voting stage, students can vote themselves or delegate their vote to others. For instance, uh, choosing between two books you have to read during class, uh, one might want to delegate their vote to someone who has read both books. Now once voting is over, saying yes or no to the single ideas, the ideas are sorted 
by popularity, and the most popular ideas are then implemented. Implementation is under the responsibility of the student who proposed the idea. Of course, teachers and parents can help, but only when asked. Ala is going to pilot in four different schools all over Germany. After that, the system can be evaluated and improved and can be adapted by other schools free of charge. And then we would like to expand to other countries as well as other forms of institutions. Let me just start. Let me. I want to actually ask Ben one question just to get us started. Ben, you, you know, you're a student of electoral reformism, if you will, um, and you mentioned the United States. I think you used the adjective sclerotic, um, and but that leads me to a sort of a deeper question: is what, what allows electoral reformism to occur? What, what's a characteristic in countries where you see countries experimenting with electoral systems? The, the examples you give are very wide ranging in a sense. There's no common pattern geographically or even politically in a certain sense. What, what do you think are some of the elements that allow? Because as we know, I know having been involved in some assistance projects where assistance providers arrive in a country that it's at a very important political juncture and say, gee, you could undertake electoral you know, reform. It's, it's, it's one of the most difficult questions because it gets right into the DNA of the political system and, and everybody's going to be either a winner or a loser in some sense. In it. So tell me a little bit more about electoral reforms. Yeah, that's, that's dead right, Tom. So I think everyone knows uh, one of the uh, many iron laws of politics is the iron law of electoral reform, which is that the people who have to make the reform are the sitting legislators who've been, who've been elected under the existing system. So what's their incentive to change it? That's, and that's a universal mm. truth. Um, but it's also the case that reform does occur. When does it occur? Um, most obviously when political calculation by uh, the incumbents um, suggests that they would benefit from a reform. Um, that's not universal, but it, 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 it can happen. Um, when there's a crisis, um, the Indonesians were able to push through these reforms because they'd had a, a revolution. Mm -hmm. um, there is uh, at least one case I know of of a prime minister who misread his briefing notes and was supposed to say we're not we're not going to have a referendum on electoral reform and he, he said we will have a referendum and it was passed. <laughs> that was how New Zealand managed to change to proportional representation. But in the sorts of I mean the, you mentioned the United States, mm. um, the sorts of experiments that are happening now are really being pushed by uh, uh, I think Philippe mentioned this at the local level. Um, by a range of groups who have just come to the conclusion that the existing system is, you know, polarising, is, is contributing to these much deeper problems. I mean, it's hard to get people focused on technical details of electoral reform. But I think a lot of people can see that in the US, for, uh, for example, something is going wrong. Something fundamental is going wrong with the country that, you know, invented a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a, a wide range, ra wide ranging answer. Yeah. yeah, I know in the Republican Party there's a feeling of you know we have to review the primary system for choosing candidates. Yeah, we're not going to do this again. We you know so you're right. A, a sense of crisis is provoking some thinking, but we've got to rewrite the rules on voting. Let me turn to just a question for you, Patricio, based on your presentation. Were you motivated in your study by? I wasn't quite sure actually. By the, in a sense, was. The, was the puzzle that, that motivated you to do this the idea that maybe parties were not responding to, to shocks? Or was it more, we assume they are and maybe they are less? What, which, which direction were you leaning, in a sense? What, what were you getting at? Thank you for the question. It was both. Actually, we were not certain if uh, the parties were reacting or not. So, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, me and my colleagues say, no, no, but look at this case. No, there they are reactional, but look at it. The, there they are not doing anything. Mm -hmm. So, actually, it was exactly the paper is called to adapt or to disregard. Exactly. 
<laughs> because of that. And, and the answer was yes. They are yes, they are adapting if the impact is high enough in the country, mm -hmm. so they react more, mm -hmm. and if they are in government, mm -hmm. then the opposition. The opposition doesn't propose too many changes in their previous policy right. proposals. Okay. Any question for you, Philippe? Uh, it's a little bit to the side of the things you're talking about, but I know it's a question you've been pondering more than people often ask me this question. I say, the only person I know who's thinking about this carefully is Philippe Schmetter. Go talk to him. I know. Imagine that. Um, and the question is can you have a democracy without parties? Something every democracy dreams of these days. Um, yes, I've written about this. Yeah. Um, well, the most obvious answer, of course, is to go back to the origins of democracy and you mm -hmm. pick people or representatives randomly. It could be a stratified sample, but we could talk about that. But uh, then, because in the origins of political parties are not in the electorate. <gasps> parties formed first in parliament, <coughs> right? So in a sense, the sequence, you change the sequence, you have random, and then once these people are chosen, then they form parties and, if, for example, combine to produce a government if it's a parliamentary system. It gets a little bit more messy if it's a presidential system. So you need parties to run a legislature. You don't necessarily need parties. So the idea would be that anybody can nominate him or herself. And with a certain number of signatures, you cross a threshold and you become a candidate. Then you can have elections. That would be another way of doing it. Let's assume, therefore, I mean, if it's random, the problem, of course, is, is motivation and many other people have other things to do, etc. So, you know, you don't know exactly how the randomness will fit, so to speak, the career and other intentions of the population. So randomness may be too, unless you do some kind of a stratified sample. But if you're going to have elections, then the important thing is that you destroy parties' monopoly over the nomination process. Mm -hmm. So that you, you introduce a nomination system which is not monopolized by parties, but which people, individual candidates, generate a, a certain number of signatures that puts them on the ballot, right? Mm -hmm. That would be, mm -hmm. and then you assume that once these people are in a parliament, they will form parties. They will form coalitions to produce legislation. But a coalition is not the same as a party. Could be no, it is. No, no. Yeah, so I agree. But, but presumably the basis that, that those coalitions will form which will sustain themselves across Plus, issues. Right. At that point they become quasi-parties. Yeah, You're right. You could imagine a situation where the, coal the winning coalition is quite different from on each successive mm -hmm. and that could be pretty difficult mm -hmm. to manage. But I'm assuming as it happened in most of these mm -hmm. British, for example, they do form relatively And would that correspond with your other view, which is that I know you have a view of sort of contemporary Western democracy as kind of multiple cleavages democracy in which the traditional cleavage of center right, center left no longer prevails as a single organizing framework for how voters think about their both identity and their ascription to groups. And so that a voter thinks, well, on environmental issues, I sort of feel this way, but on uh, this economic tax issue, I feel that way. So you're kind of imagining uh, a non-party system that corresponds to a voter not wanting to just sign up for one party, yeah. in a sense, wanting that's to have multiple sort of co uh, shifting coalitions. That, that that's correspond. exactly one of the under, I mean, th mm -hmm. that's an, the underlying sociology, if you wish, right. of this kind of a proposal is that the simplifying principle which guided the formation and competition of political parties, this left-right mm -hmm. spectrum and the centripetal competition toward the middle doesn't work when you have, not only do you have multiple cleavages that overlap and don't form distinctive clusters anymore, but in many of these things there's no middle. Right. So the assumption of a normal wet liberal democracy is that the preference structure looks this famous, like the famous bell-shaped curve, and therefore you will get this centripetal competition. But what if the if the thing looks like this? I mean, particularly if it's a dichotomous mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of thing, right? Then mm -hmm. the competition is centrifugal, right? 
So that's the only answer in those cases is, it seems to me, to adjust the party system by essentially abolishing parties or letting them die out. They're dying anyway, incidentally, so it's, it's, you wouldn't have to kill them. They're, they're pretty much <laughs> disappearing. And then allow, uh, open up this nomination process to some sort of bottom. And in mm -hmm. fact, I think very much social movements would be very much involved in the mobilization of signatures, et cetera, for these kind of candidacies. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's bring others into this conversation, uh, elections, parties, and so forth, and just like to get your reactions to some of these people said, other ideas you have. But could I just um, say yeah. two, two things about, yeah. um, for this electoral thing, there's a very interesting concept from jo John Rawls that may help understand. It's called the veil of ignorance, and that the time when you will get electoral reform is when the veil is thick. <laughs> that is to say, people on either side don't know what the <laughs> outcome of the reform is going to be. And that, of course, typically happens at times of democratization. So you're, you're creating a democracy, as say in Indonesia, et cetera, recreating, but after a long period of non-democracy. And that's a typical period where the veil is thick. You don't really know who's going to benefit from what kind of rules, uh, the electoral rules. So crisis also makes the veil thicker, right? Some kinds of reforms are ambiguous about it. This is what we tried to do in here. We kind of pretended that all of the reforms we suggested were not I should say, aimed at benefiting a particular group. Mm. It wasn't always true, but we tried to pretend that way. So again, so I, I just encourage you, if you're thinking about electoral reform, to, have, to use this concept of the veil of ignorance, and that is a moment in which you get more reform. Patricia, yours is, I would find the findings counterintuitive. The message of your presentation is political parties work. They respond in this wonderful, reflexive way to crisis. And yet, the, the, so the, my real question is, do the voters and their members even know this to be the case? And so the, the problem here is, yes, parties in their doctrine or whatever it is may re reflect, but those who are expected to vote and choose between political parties don't recognize it for some reason or another. So the, 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 what's important is the, sort of the next step, the perception that the public has of these changes. Comment on that, Patricia, then I'm going to turn to the audience. Um, thank you for the question. Um, yes and no. <laughs> so actually, I have been working a lot in legislative production. And this is always kind of one of the questions like, yeah, the voters don't know anything about what is being uh, legislated. Uh, there are several studies that kind of prove that voters know, but they, they of course are not reading the laws. And I think here is the same. They know via um, the, the gatekeepers in the mass media, for instance, right, how also the, the opposition parties, how they frame things when they are interested in that. Um, but do they trust what the message is. You see, if distrust is increasing, and we've got lots of evidence of that, yeah. then they could change. They could even know that a change took place, but they wouldn't trust that the change would actually make a change in their behavior. Right? That's the, the missing link, if I may. Yeah, of, of course. It's, it's, we can make a, a more fine analysis, but for that, you have to see exactly uh, for instance, discourses of the, the government and so on, and say exactly what they, they said, but also sometimes what they say is not what they do, right? No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if, you have, if you have a good uh, suggestion how I can grasp that, I, it would be you or somebody else, mm -hmm. because that, it's hard to personalize no, this, this it, link it is, exactly. It There's is the some paradox. Thing. Parties are working. That's what I read from your thing, and yet nobody believes this. <laughs> no, they are, they are shifting. No, I didn't say that they are working. I said that they are shifting. Uh, well, that's a form of adaptation, and that's called working. Right? Yes. I mean, that's, I think, you know, I mean. Well, it's what the data tell us, right? Like, experts say that uh, there is these parties that are shifting positions. If you buy that this data is reliable, yeah. then okay. the results are. Right. If not, <laughs> that's what you, okay. Let's turn to the audience. Who'd like to come in? And uh, yeah, I'll take Ethan in the back. You go ahead and introduce yourself to the group when you speak. Yeah. <coughs> sure. Hi, I'm uh, Ethan Zuckerman. 
thank you for a very interesting panel and uh, quite lively, quite stimulating. Um, this question is, is primarily for Professor Schmitter, but uh, to, to a certain extent for Professor Riley as well. Uh, I, I'm very interested in how we get from these very thoughtful interventions into how we could change electoral systems, how we would bring any of these into practice. And my concern with this is in established electoral systems, the electoral system works pretty well for the people who are in power. It may not work especially well for anybody else. Um, there are moments of crisis. The Republican Party in the United States may realize that they have now built a, a primary system that simply isn't working for them as a party anymore. But much larger intractable problems, uh, so in the US, the problem of, of redistricting and gerrymandering um, seems largely unsolvable because the people who benefit from these ludicrously drawn districts are exactly the same people who then get to go and, and write the rules for how it happens the next time. Yeah. So I, I just to be truly provocative here, are we going to get any of these very clever solutions you put on the table without some sort of mass disruption, revolution, real crisis? Um, you, you're turning me into a Trotskyite here, and I'm sort of wondering whether you want to talk me down. I mean, that's a sub, thank you, Ethan. I mean, you put a, a sharp edge to what's an underlying yeah. question of this panel, which is, in a sense, <clears throat> democracy perceived to be in trouble, some say, in crisis, is reformism possible? Yeah. You're right. I mean, that, that's the underlying question. So that's why I sort of asked you about when, when, when did these reforms occur? Um, let's take one or two more. That's, that's, that's a big one. So let me take one. I've got uh, this gentleman here, then I'll come back here, and then. Uh, okay, yeah. thank you. Um, I would like to. Combined. You could uh, introduce yourself. Just yeah, to... my name is Matthias Bogarts. I'm a visiting professor here at CU. Mm -hmm. uh, this morning we heard about social movements. In this panel, the talk was all about political parties. Um, and I would like to invite the panel to, to connect the two, uh, focusing on the question do new social movements make better parties? And I'm thinking of recent examples like the Five Star Movement in Italy, Podemos in, in Spain. Uh, are these social movements as political parties, are they going to revolution, revolutionize the party landscape or are they going to fall back into the same old traps and problems? Uh, mm -hmm. This basically calls for a prediction. And then, um, second point in, in uh, connection to what Marina Weisband said uh, on, on the screen, uh, she talked about liquid feedback and li liquid democracy in the Pirate Party in Germany and also in schools. Now, a couple of years ago at Jacobs University Bremen, uh, the president uh, tried to introduce uh, liquid feedback. Um, within half a year, he was fired <laughs> by the board of governors. Um, probably not just because of that. Um, but this raises a bigger question, and I don't want to cause any trouble to see you that is celebrating its 25th <laughs> birthday, but, but, um, you know, it's all very nice and well to talk about democratization in, in Indonesia and, and improving politics in the U.S. Uh, but what about schools? What about universities? What about maybe this university? Uh, the lessons and the suggestions and the innovations that you talked about, how relevant are they for universities? Well, it's not a surprise the next person I'm calling on is John, um, who I will notice stepping down voluntarily from his position. Um, <laughs> Actually, I thought maybe as a final act I could um, adapt the principle that liquid, <laughs> liquid democracy should be part of CEU. <laughs> uh, I think um, my question is about referenda. We are, after all, uh, in the midst of one right now in Britain. Um, and I don't really think that referendum or any other major referendum is necessarily a product of a political party um, or an electoral process. It's a product of a major disruptive event. So in a sense, I'm, I'm agreeing with Ethan here, which is that um, maybe the only way in which these kinds of uh, reforms that you've been discussing or indeed um, something more general such as a referendum uh, democracy 
Maybe they only can come about as a result of major social and political disruption. And Intasar, I don't know whether she's in the room, but she gave a very, thank you, a very, very uh, thoughtful, I thought, presentation about what was going on in Tunisia, which is a constant and continuous disruption. Do we need that kind of disruption in order to imagine any kind of serious reform, and specifically asking about the referendum issue as well? Okay, let's pause there with those questions. We'll come back to you and turn back to the panel. And then after I turn back to the panel, if either Donatella or Eduardo would like to comment on the question on movements, particularly the Spanish or the Italian case, the relationship of new movements to, or not, the relationship <laughs> how new movements as they become parties act. And uh, I think it'd be interesting to hear. So uh, let's come back, Ben. Yeah. Um, so uh, is reform possible? Well, uh, Reform is actually taking place. I mean, I, was, I, I, I think I gave some examples of actual electoral system changes that actually have happened in the actual United States. And, uh, okay, admittedly, small scale, local level, but um, there's been at least uh, one state that has voted on these reforms. There may be another um, coming up, depending if, they can, if the reformers can get enough signatures um, <clears throat> to get it on the ballot in November. But these are... This isn't the redistricting issue. The redistricting issue is harder. The problem with the redistricting issue is what you said, that the, the legislators own it. Um, that's not the case in most countries, most democracies. Yeah. You know, most democracies put this outside of the reach of legislators deliberately. Um, <clears throat> the only thing that I, th I can think of in the United States that might be worth trying at some point is national embarrassment. You know, this, this, this is, you know, really, I mean, that, that, that if enough people know that it is an embarrassment that the great democracy of the United States should have all this Rorschach block shaped congressional districts and that no one else does it that way and we're stuck with it. I know that doesn't often work, the comparison thing with the US, but hey, maybe it's worth a try, you know, that, 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 that this, is our, this is an embarrassment well, for us. One of my students started selling jigsaw puzzles of gerrymandered congressional districts. Good idea. Yeah. Buy and assemble at home. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, that's um, um, Patricia, would you like to make any? You don't have to. Uh, but if you'd like to make comments, then I'll come to Philippe. About, um, so I, c I can comment on if the, this, if the new parties are becoming better. It, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, actually, I don't, I don't know. I think that once they are fully institutionalized, they are like the others, but this is a belief. I don't really have proof of this. Um, and about the, the disruption and the referendum, well, I hope to still enter in Great Britain when I return, because let's just see the results. But um, I, I, I just like to think this as if the threat is big enough, I think things can change. And if it's not big enough, I think it's just there, out there. But this is also hard to to <coughs> grasp, I think. Yeah. OK. Yes. yes. Um, the first comment. Um, you put your finger on something which is extremely important and which I think we have to address. I usually think of it as the agency problem. So we have lots of interesting suggestions. We know a, a little bit where the shoe is pinching, uh, so we can tell that things are, where, not only that there is this widespread dissatisfaction, but I think we even know why it exists. And we have some what, agents, right? And here it's a problem because it's precisely the confused cleavage structures that make it very difficult for agents to appear, right? Obviously, agency is more possible when you are democratizing, that is to say, moving from some form of autocracy to democracy, then agency is extremely important. And there's a nice thick veil of ignorance, so you're not quite sure what, who's going to benefit from what kinds of rules. And therefore, that's a situation that encourages agency, but we're not talking about democratization from autocratic rule. We're talking about democratization within real existing democracies. 
And, you know, in the past, we had a pretty clear idea of who those agents were, and they were the people who were excluded from <laughs> the process, you know, working class being at one point, but also women <laughs> and various other ethnic groups, depending on the country, of course, religious uh, people, etc. We don't have such a, a clear, sociologically generated <laughs> collective agent, so to speak. So that's a big question. Where are these agents? Now, I suppose, <laughs> looking at Donatella, is that, that is one of the sources of agency <laughs> is the social movements and the people who, entrepreneurs who start social movements and mobilize people and devote themselves to you know, uh, that sort of thing. But the problem, of course, there is that there may be not so much that there are too many social movements, but they can't combine uh, sufficiently to pr produce an alliance which could make for substantial changes in the rules. But you're absolutely right. And of course, I often say the problem with contemporary democracy is it, there's no revolutionary threat. It was a wonderful thing for them. The Cold War was a great thing for democracy. And the rev no, I mean, we owe a lot to uh, the Soviet Union uh, in terms of the survival of democracy after World War II, because clearly you could justify whatever you did in democracy because it was somehow better than what was going on on the other side of the wall. But once the wall disappeared, they had to start justifying democracy in its own, in its own terms. And if there's no prospective revolutionary threat, you're not going to get reform. That was where it came. Historically, you needed a threat of revolution or at least large-scale rebellion or something like that before you got. So just generalized disorder <laughs> will not do the job, it seems to me. And that's the, that's the part of the answer. Social movements becoming political parties. I mean, i biased here because I observed this in Italy, and, uh, and um, it's clearly a very serious problem. That is, as soon as social movement people start sitting in parliament and, and beginning to run cities, which they're doing, and you just saw this for Rome now and, and, and uh, Torino, uh, then they get they make compromises. They do things which were not promised, so to speak. And at least in the case of Italy, this runs up against an extremely, shall we say, autocratic movement that is focused around a single person. So what Beppe Grillo does is he expels them from the party all the time. So if you vote the wrong way in the parliament, you get expelled from the party. or as a mayor or whatever it is. So this is a very good point, that, that, that this, um, this transformation of social movements into governing uh, units with governing responsibility, whether this is at the city level or in the national parliaments, uh, it, it seems to me to be a serious problem. And another problem, which I was thinking of in the first thing, it's what I call the problem of the transformation of the virtual into the real. That's the problem a lot of these electronic movements. I think this was, this was brought to my attention when I was in Egypt because obviously virtual groups and connections were extremely important in mobilizing people to go to the square, et cetera, and then expanded into other groups. But those groups could not form a real organizational group. And then that's where the Brotherhood, which was a real organizational group, grabbed the power. The Brotherhood was not involved in the mobilization. So the, the benefits of the mobilization suddenly went to a real group and the virtual communities or whatever you want to call them did not, were incapable of transforming themselves. So this transformation process seems to be very, very quick on referendums. There's a, a huge difference in the political implications and contributions to democracy between countries or units where referendum is a relatively routine operation. Switzerland, California, the two that I know best. And in that case, when you have multiple referendums and you're sort of accustomed to them being conducted, the vote tends to focus on the issue in the referendum. So it's up or down for something that, you know, and my experience is that, by and large, the votes are reasonable. Collective choices like that are, I don't agree with the results always, but they're clearly reasonable choices 
taken collectively. The big problem is the erratic referendum. It has a completely different uh, dynamic because, and I think you'll see this ad absurdum in the case of Great Britain, but it also has happened many, many times, because you, the referendum never is about the issue itself. It's always going to have piled on top of it other kinds of expressions of distrust, distaste, whatever it is, with the government in power or whatever. So that, that's the, the problem. So we, I think it's important to distinguish between referendum as a relatively routine device, which I happen to think is a good thing, or re referendums conducted called erratically, and those almost always produce perverse outcomes. So that's the, that, that's the, just my own. So if you're going to do referendums, do them regularly. <laughs> Don't <laughs> just do them occasionally. I think this question of movements to, movements to parties both connects the two panels, but is, is interesting and fundamental. So I would like to ask, do you have any thoughts on that, or Edwina? Yeah. Could somebody hand her a microphone there? Yeah, thanks. Well, I, I don't want to take mm -hmm. too much time since I took so much time in the morning, but I think that uh, new movement parties deserve a panel in, in the next round of Frontiers of Democracy because, uh, because of two reasons. One, uh, Philippe said uh, uh, there is no revolutionary movement, so there is no ch um, challenge. I partially disagree with that because I think that uh, for many cases, and in fact, party uh, scholars have often said change comes from crisis and defeats. Uh, and uh, for many um, political system, party systems, there have been events perceived as big defeats. So if PASOK goes from 50 to 5 percent, it is something which really challenges the system. Not that PASOK did change a lot, but it produced uh, alternatives. And the same is true when uh, uh, the uh, Italian center-left loses uh, Rome and Turin. This is a challenge. Now, I think that uh, about these uh, parties, and so the questions, uh, uh, do they institutionalize? Of course they do to a certain extent, but I, I think that uh, it is the Michels type of development, uh, which brings about uh, some more uh, moderatism, uh, attempt to get the voters of the center left and so on. But at the same time, there are also innovations. Labor parties institutionalized, but they introduced big changes uh, uh, in the uh, conceptions of the parties themselves. The mass parties was an invention of the left. And I think That's that precisely this- what they are not doing now the mass political party. They are not doing it because we are under different circumstances. Yeah, yeah. And there, it would not be an innovation now. But uh, I think that there are uh, 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 all these changes which would be very useful to start studying in Latin America, where uh, uh, there, there have also been a lot of challenges to the political system. And, uh, and they tell us uh, that there are experiments. So I agree very much with Philippe when he said there are experiments at the local level, which is worth looking at. And there are so many parties, besides Podemos, besides uh, uh, Syriza, but also the Pirates Party is leading the polls in Iceland. Uh, uh, other new parties alternative are creating in, even in systems which were considered as uh, uh, quite uh, traditional uh, from Germany uh, to Denmark. And all these parties without uh, succeeding in uh, uh, finding the right solutions, but they're introducing elements uh, uh, of reflection, some new channels on participations. And this, I think, is, uh, mm -hmm. is uh, important. So I do expect some type of adaptations, but adaptations that didn't come without change, and especially Ken Roberts, studying Latin America, talked about critical junctures, which produced big changes, uh, especially in countries in which the center left had compromised with the neoliberal model, and I expect something like this. Yeah, just about five more minutes. I want to get a couple more questions or comments from the audience. I want to come over here and then back over here to Julia. Thank you. Uh, my name is Maya Nanadovic, and I have two questions. My first question is on um, 
I don't know how we're calling them nowadays, new democracies, transitioning countries, ethnically divided, polarizing, I'm not sure, but I'm looking at you, Professor Riley. My observation is that in these countries, there is a tacit acceptance or resignation to corruption being a normal part of politics. And I know that we have both worked or studied on external intervention or democracy promotion through providing assistance to political parties. So I'm wondering whether there is anything anybody can do from the outside to get people in these countries to get more outraged about corruption in politics. <laughs> because right now, essentially, in many countries that I've worked in, the people see choice in politics as between voting for those who have stolen so far or giving a chance to those others who haven't stolen yet. So, and you, you can see how this is a non-choice. Uh, my second question uh, pertains to youth. Uh, we've heard from Professor Schmitter that uh, young people, that parties speak more, more, more to older people because older people uh, tend to show up in the uh, voting booths. And the most uh, clearest data that I will take with me from this conference is from the previous session where uh, in Tunisia we saw that 80% of young people aged 18 to 24 didn't vote in elections in 2014. Um, among other things I do, I'm a debate coach and in the last four years I've coached debate in over 40 countries worldwide. And I can tell you that doesn't matter if I work in Middle East, in East or West of Europe, or in South America, or in the United States, my students are disenfranchised. They don't feel like politics matters, they don't feel their vote matters. So I guess my question to all of you is, what is the implication of, in general, a whole young generation being disillusioned with democracy? What is the implication for democracy of this? And in what way can we get them to get involved? Because to echo Professor Bogart's uh, suggestion, my students also feel that they don't have a voice at the university. Thank you. Okay, we'll take one more here too. Um, well, I'm British, so I just thought I'd raise that so I could be bathed in everybody's sympathy today. Um, but apart from being British, I also work on Venezuela, and I've worked on Venezuela for 20 years, um, and so any comments I make on Venezuela in the Latin American context are from the early days of the post-revolutionary period and not the situation we have today. Um, so just in terms of the British referendum, um, I think one of the, the aspects of this which is really, really pivotal, which um, seems to have been slightly overlooked, although touched upon was the role of the media um, because, and particularly the social media um, and because that was quite shocking for me as a British person to see how influential social media was but not just Twitter and the usual Facebook but the use of bots and the manipulation of social media to artificially conflate um, the impression of, of the popularity of a particular campaign or position. Um, but then my question to Patricia was, when you're talking about uh, political parties moved, my sense of what happened in, in the UK, in Britain, um, after the financial crisis was that it was a kind of secondary effect on the, on the UK because of you know the impact of migration allegedly into the UK, although bearing in mind Brits are the world's 10th largest migrating community out of Britain, so actually we migrate more out of Britain um, than we have people moving in. But it wasn't a whole party that shifted, it was the parties that split, particularly the Conservative Party. So when you're talking about parties moving, are you, ta you're, are you dealing with parties as a homogenous factor? And then just on Venezuela, um, for a long time we were working with the likes of the late and lamented Doreen Massey um, <coughs> to build you know, popular power, a new geometry of power in Venezuela. We introduced, the government introduced initiatives such as recall referendum on officials and what we've actually seen now with the recall referendum process is that as soon as an opposition loses an election they then spend the next three years mobilizing to remove the president through a recall referenda which then just brings me finally to Benjamin which is that when we're talking about where did these reforms come from in Venezuela where we were where organizations such as the Carter Center were trying to work through was the election administration um, so I just wondered what your views were on the role of independent election administrations in their capacity to leverage electoral system reform. Okay, that was a lot. But uh, both of you, those are deep questions. It's one minute to three, so let's have uh, incisive answers. Uh, ben, any comments? Well, look, um, I, I, I don't, let's talk about some of these specific questions in the break, but I, there is one comment I want to make that, that connects to pretty much everything which we haven't quite touched on. As Philippe said, political parties began in Parliament. Why did they begin in Parliament? Because there needed to be some way of aggregating and having predictability in regards to decisions. 
This is the big problem, whether we're talking about university governance or social movements or referenda. The problem with all of these things is there has to be a way of not having just a one-off decision, but a way of aggregate. Let me, let me give you the classic example. We were chatting about this last night. Would we all like more social services? Yes. Would we like to pay lower taxes? Yes. OK. You, you split off those issues sequentially, and that's what you get. Well, you get chaos. You get So there has to be a way of bringing those issues together. And I don't see an alternative to the party. Uh, and it's exactly the same at universities. The, the issues of university governance, I will bet, that derailed your vice chancellor had to do with the allocation of resources and who was going to, you know, who wanted someone else to pay for them. Um, so aggregation is key, and we ignore it at our peril. Mm -hmm. Patricia, any final comments? Um, Don't have to. Before I answer to you, um, just maybe one idea how how you can how you can check if um, not a solution for how younger people can participate more, but um, so. I analyzed with a colleague some data from Portugal at a district level, and it seems like higher levels of unemployment uh, drive higher levels of turnout. And this unemployment, in the case of Portugal, was essentially in the younger ones. So I don't know exactly what this does, but this has an influence there. Maybe young people think that doesn't matter their vote because it's not going to change anything and if they are unemployed and everything is bad, maybe they want to change it. I don't know, it's an interpretation that you can okay. give. Yeah, this is the most, that is a very a challenging question. How do you motivate young people to participate? Of course, there is a formula. You make voting obligatory. and. Yeah, please write that. I, I was waiting for him. That's Australia and Belgium, and there, they, there is a slightly higher effect. If you put it in as a dummy and a regression, you will get a positive score. But the problem, of course, is that is it enforced? And therefore, we we discussed obligatory voting in our little group, and we rejected it. So, but anyway, that's one simplistic answer is you force people to vote and you but then you have to worry about uh, what are the sanctions for not doing it and that's very difficult to sustain politically so the answer i think one of them was this idea of universal citizenship because when you vote you would actually have more of an effect because what we're in now is a vicious cycle governments systematically bias their policy outputs in favor of old people. And young people know this and say, it's not our government. I mean, our vote doesn't matter because we will we'll be systematically or regularly outvoted by older people. So that seems to me um, at the core is this vicious circle. And how do you break that? Right, And I, I say universal citizenship. I think that this idea also of vouchers, because one of the per perverse things about present uh, funding of political parties is parties have no incentive to have new members. They get the money based on the voting totals of the previous election. But So if you had vouchers and you actually had to have people go to, to get your money, somebody would have to actually go to the poll and sign that, whatever. Then there would be a strong incentive for political parties to encourage their followers or their sympathizers or whatever it is to vote. And that would be in large part young people because they are most of the non-voters. So that could also, because then parties would have to take a much more proactive uh, role in encouraging voter turnout. Uh, thanks to all three of our hardworking panelists. We appreciate it in your participation. We have a short break now, and then at 3.15, we'll be back here. Thank you. Thank you.